Well, I have a song of a different kind. Uh, I'll focus on the descent um, mainly. And um, what I want to, um, you know, if one looks at the Nehruvian era, that is the uh, period when he was prime minister, uh, the uh, major events when one thinks of dissent or where one thinks of um, analyzing his response to a dissenting tendency, uh, one thinks of um, Ambedkar's uh, resignation focusing on the Hindu code bill. One thinks of Sheikh Abdullah, Kashmir, and one thinks of uh, Kerala uh, president's rule, the dismissal of uh, uh, EMS's government. And um, in the public discourse, most of these um, events have, or uh, uh, tendencies have been appropriated in a manner or presented in a manner that uh, holds Nehru um, to be uh, entirely in the wrong. But um, when one looks at it closely, and I've been looking um, closely at some of the documents related to this, uh, this the picture is much more complex. But that is uh, something I will touch upon. But my main focus today is on the socialists. Uh, you know, the socialists, uh, the socialist group had been founded uh, within the Indian National Congress in May 1934. Um, that is, they held the foundation convention uh, at Patna uh, on 17th May. And then uh, <clears throat> a few months later, they had their first uh, conference at uh, Bombay. And it remained a group within the, uh, within the Congress until it finally left uh, after Gandhiji's assassination. Uh, so Gandhiji was assassinated on 30th January 48 and the socialists uh, March uh, 1948, they held their convention at Nasik and decided to leave. Now why this is most intriguing to me is because uh, if you look at the reason why the socialist group was formed, um, Acharya Narendra Dev in his writings and uh, later on Madhulimay also stresses on the fact that it was not just differences with Gandhi and so on uh, or the um, so-called Congress right. But uh, Madhulimay has written that um, had the communist group, that is the communist party, taken a more friendly stance towards Indian nationalism, we may never have had to set up the socialist, uh, the Congress Socialist Party. You remember the Congress Socialist Party was set up as a Marxist group. Um, its retreat from Marxism takes place post-independence under Loya. But when it was first set up uh, with Acharya Narendra Dev as its uh, main ideologue, not JP. JP was organizationally the uh, efficient force within the Congress Socialist Party, but its um, ideological line in pre-independence was set by Acharya Narendra Dev. And Acharya Narendra Dev's outlook was that we have to struggle together because after independent, when India does become independent, hum Hindustan ko apne haath se banayenge. That is, we will make India with our own hands together after independence. And then after independence, they leave. Uh, that is, within a few months of independence, the socialists leave. So the entire rationale of uh, setting up the Congress Socialist Group, and um, then leaving immediately after independence, the entire purpose seems to be defeated. Secondly, what is intriguing about this is that while one can understand 
Nehru's uh, difficulty in uh, keeping the communist uh, sections aligned to the Congress. Uh, one can even understand the difficulty in keeping Dr. Ambedkar within the Congress frame for long, after post-independence, because uh, both these tendencies uh, stood outside the overall Indian National Congress framework in the sense that although many communist leaders were often simultaneously members of the Congress, they were, they took, they formulated lines separately, often, and pursued lines uh, quite autonomously of the leadership of the Indian National Congress. But the socialist line was entirely different. That is, they conceived of themselves as being in the vortex of the national struggle, as persons who accepted the central line, uh, the uh, entire uh, process, uh, decision-making process of the Indian National Congress, and the rationale of the Indian National Congress as the organization that was leading the struggle against imperialism. <coughs> and yet, after independence, within a few months, when the time comes to uh, for construction of the country, we find them leaving. Now, uh, why I consider this significant is that um, it leaves Nehru so much the weaker in having to um, uh, undertake the tasks which the newly independent nation has to undertake and fulfill. And uh, it also, uh, we talk a lot about dynasty and so on, but um, if one looks at uh, the departure of the socialists, it's easy to see that had the socialists chosen a different course, uh, the Congress would have had the wherewithal, uh, the intellect, the caliber, to uh, provide after Nehru uh, a leadership which would uh, perhaps have taken a different course. So um, I think out of all the dissensions and splits and resignations that arose in the history of the Indian National Congress post-independence, the departure of the socialists is the most significant because it determined the long-term, uh, uh, determined to a large extent, the long-term character of uh, the Indian National Congress. And uh, the second uh, came later, that is the 1969 split. I'll touch on that uh, briefly, but uh, that is post-Nehru, so uh, it's not really the main subject on which uh, I want to dwell today. <coughs> now, looking at the... <coughs> at what the reactions of the socialists themselves were. Jay Prakash Narayan makes an interesting statement uh, soon after Nehru's death, and I will uh, quote that. Uh, in July 1964, that is a few weeks after Jawaharlal Nehru's death, he says, leaving the Congress in 1948 to form the Socialist Party was a mistake committed on account of the wrong assessment of the character of the Congress. So JP recognizes in May, in, May, <coughs> uh, in uh, July 1964, uh, Jawaharlalji died in uh, May, uh, that the departure of the socialists from the uh, Congress was a mistake. And he says, then he was asked why? So he says, most of his party men, that is the party men, the socialist colleagues, thought at the time that the Congress would slowly develop into a conservative come liberal party, just like what the Swatantra party is today. But history belied this assessment. So he uh, recognizes that history belied the assessment that uh, the Congress would develop into uh, 
uh, organism somewhat like what the Swatantra Party was in 1964. But um, <clears throat> if you look at the reasons given at the time of the departure of the socialists from the Congress, in March 1948 and thereabouts, most of them center about, uh, they are not focused on the long-term vision for India. They are not focused on uh, what would happen to the Congress after they leave. They are focused on um, personalities, uh, Lohia, Nehru, Jay Prakash, Patel, uh, they are focused on, um, very unconvincingly, on an amendment being made to a rule uh, in the Congress Constitution, and so on. Uh, so the larger uh, issue of how the Congress would fare and how the nation would fare if the socialists left the Congress is largely ignored by them. Acharya Narendra Dev, uh, in fact, made a speech um, at a year before the departure of the socialists uh, in which he um, suggested that he was not in uh, favor of leaving. Uh, he said the Congress can still be a vehicle for uh, democratic, and, uh, uh, democratic and socialist transformation. But a year later, at Nasik, he went along with the line which was being pushed by Jay Prakash Narayan and uh, Dr. Lohia. And uh, that led to a permanent rupture which ultimately um, became so severe that you see the we saw the consequences in 1967 when the socialists uh, aligned, uh, allied themselves even with the Jansang against the Congress. And uh, we see them even now where the many sections of the socialists are unable to take a clear position on the issues of the day. Uh, so this uh, is uh, a matter on which, uh, which has had very uh, major consequences uh, for the fate uh, of our country. Apart from this, <coughs> there is another <coughs> issue that, uh, that is of great importance, and that is the question of constructive the constructive work programs. Now, you know, the history of the, co uh, the uh, constructive work programs is that they were conceived largely in the non -co during the non-cooperation movement of the 1920s. And uh, the, non uh, the constructive work program was set out uh, in great detail in uh, booklets which were written by Mahatma Gandhi. They were further worked on by Rajan Prasad then again revised by Mahatma Gandhi in 1941. Now, on this question of constructive work programs, there is again uh, a very interesting acknowledgement by Jay Prakash Narayan. He says, um, looking back, it seems to me, this is roughly the same time as the other statement which I quoted, Looking back, it seems to me that we would have done well to associate ourselves with the constructive work of the Congress to a far greater extent than we did. We were responsible, and I more than others perhaps, in creating the feeling that all constructive work was unrevolutionary and for socialists a waste of time. I should like to put it on record that that was an immature and mistaken view. Possibly, if we had come into the field of constructive work, we might have developed aspects or types of it that would perhaps have enriched it. But whether that would have happened or not, there is no doubt that we have impoverished ourselves a great deal by keeping out of that valuable field of activity, which would have given us experience and a wider mass contact and enabled us to understand rural India in a more intimate manner. Now, this is recognized even in the writings of N.G. Ranga that it is Gandhi's constructive work program that took the national movement into the village, in, into 
the villages of India. There is an important speech which uh, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan made on this question in May 1934. In 1934, at the Bombay session, that is September, I think, September 1934, in which he set out the importance which the constructive program had for the act political activities of the Congress. So speaking at um, the Bombay session, he, he spoke about his recent tour that he had undertaken in Bengal, various subdivisions. And he said, uh, referring to that tour, that in subdivisions where the Khadi program had reached, resulting in some increase in incomes, howsoever small, people were willing to come forward to attend Congress meetings. The contrary was true in other subdivisions where charkha activities had not reached and where people were fearful of associating with Congress activities. Now, his speech is in uh, Hindustani and he says, <coughs> जहाँ ये खादी का प्रोग्राम पहुँचा था, वहाँ लोग हमें सुनने आते थे, और जहाँ नहीं पहुँचा था, वहाँ लोग हमसे कतराते थे। So uh, this was the important point which the construct, the uh, important element which the constructive work program lent to the Congress. Now, what happened after independence was that there was a tendency. Uh, Mahesh referred to the meeting that took place <coughs> in Vardha, uh, Vardha, where this question of um, what shall we do now, the constructive uh, workers uh, uh, in relation to the government, that had come up. Now, I think, and Nehru rightly uh, placed emphasis on um, ut the utilization of state power. But in this connection, there is an observation which, um, which is made by no less than K.R. Narayanan, uh, which attending a seminar in um, Jaipur in uh, 1970, this is before he joined politics, uh, this is before he became a minister, much less president. He said that in his passion, this is a, a seminar on Nehru and nation building, which took place in December 1970 at the University of Rajasthan in Jaipur. And um, Narayanan said that in his passion for legislative revolution, Nehru and the Indian National Congress did not, after independence, place sufficient emphasis on the aspect of a social reform movement in the country. That is, uh, Narayanan's point was that mere passing of law uh, is not enough you have to have an active social reform movement which moves in tandem with it. And somehow that aspect was uh, lost sight of uh, post-independence because the idea was that now that we are in power and we can legislate and we can enforce uh, things through the use of state power, uh, it is perhaps not as important to, um, to conduct the various activities which the constructive work programs were involved in. Um, running schools and you know national, there was a network of national schools all over the country and so on. So uh, meanwhile, the, f the uh, communal forces, and when I refer to communal forces, one may also note the change in discourse that nobody refers to the word, word communalism anymore. Uh, they, uh, you know, the uh, latest tendencies are referred to as nationalism. So even the discourse has uh, been affected by, uh, by this uh, change that has come about. But the communal forces kept working in society in terms of uh, setting up institutions, schools, uh, which would, which would um, advance their um, worldview and uh, ideas among the people while the constructive work program of the Congress, uh, not of the Congress, but associated with the Congress historically, receded. And this tendency <coughs> became more marked after the 1969 split in the Congress. Because um, uh, that was the split 
in which an attempt was made by what I would call the neo-Nehruvians to differentiate themselves from what they conceived of as being Gandhians. And this uh, Gandhi-Nehru divide, which was not actually a Gandhi-Nehru divide, it was a divide between um, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, those who wanted to uh, create a separati separatist uh, image of Nehru, differentiated and sort of uh, plucked out from the national movement, as though Nehru represented something that uh, stood apart from the national movement and, s and sprung from the sky and uh, <coughs> had no connection with our history, with our struggle. And uh, you could define a movement um, separately on that basis and uh, <coughs> uh, break the Congress. Now, the result of that was that the group which went out of the Congress traditionally had uh, greater ties with the constructive work organizations which were operating throughout the country. And so, the, although the new Congress which, was, which came about under Mrs. <laughs> Gandhi's leadership after the 1969 split, it won short-term victories in 1971 and 72 in the context of the new uh, land reforms, new steps taken in terms of bank nationalization, the Bangladesh war, <laughs> and so on. This ran out within a couple of years of the uh, 1972 state assembly elections. So uh, within two years of that, you had uh, the JP movement uh, coming, um, emerging, and you had the socialists who had, in their draft platform of 1972, said that we, in their analysis of the Jansang, had said we will have no truck we conceive of no truck with this party. By 1974, they had jumped on to uh, the bandwagon. So there was a complete, and then this, um, uh, with, with the growth in the um, grassroots organizations of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sang and the receding of the uh, constructive work um, connection of the Congress, <coughs> it was like a time bomb waiting to explode. Uh, but I should mention, Haksar's, Haksar's name came up and uh, Nain Taraji correctly uh, pointed out something there. I would like to add uh, to this that uh, <coughs> on the 1969 split, there was a difference within left-wing opinion as well. So while Haksar, and that group associated uh, around Mrs. Gandhi at that time was pushing for the split. Krishna Menon, surprisingly, Krishna Menon warned Indira Gandhi that the Congress is a movement. Don't split it. This is recorded by N.K. Session. Uh, N.K. Session uh, was, uh, he worked with, uh, in, in uh, with Nehru, uh, f uh, in the secretarial, uh, in a secretarial capacity, uh, pre from pre-independence, he started working during the interim government days, if not earlier. So, in his book, he records that Krishna Menon warned that the Congress is a movement; don't split it. Unfortunately, that advice was not taken. Uh, <coughs> On this question of the Congress right, uh, you know, I think, uh, yeah, uh, five minutes. Can I have five minutes? A little less if they're possible. <laughs> okay. On the question of the Congress right, I think that one needs a relook because what we describe as the Congress right is a Congress right within the framework of the Congress, but it is not necessarily right in relation to right wing in relation to forces operating outside the Congress. Uh, even, and in fact, I would go further. If you go back to the Hindu Mahasabha, the difference between, uh, between Madan Mohan Malwaya 
and Savarkar. It's a world of a difference. They're two entirely different worlds. Hindu, uh, Madan Mohan Valviya, so long as he's, uh, he leads the Mahasabha till about 37 or so, he is not de uh, denying the concept of Indian nation. That emerges with the rise of Savarkar. So um, I would say that uh, we should be cautious about lumping the Congress right, uh, we, uh, which is which is even more aligned with Nehru. After all, it's Nehru's. It's a party built up post independence by Nehru, and all these people are loyal to Nehru. And if they do make, <coughs> they are not. They've come through the freedom struggle. They are not academics. They are not academics. They are not uh, making politically sound judgments and statements every, because they have to speak every day. They may say something which you can pluck on, which you can latch on to and say, now why did so and so say this? But the Congress right stands by Nehru as a block. And um, there, even the differences on the 62 war, when they are asking for Krishna Menon's uh, head, they are asking for Krishna Menon's head so that the anger is turned against Krishna Menon rather than at Nehru. And uh, there are so many recorded interviews where this is very clear. So thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry I took more time. Than <laughs>